now on BBC One, Tom Cunliffe takes a trip down the River Trent on a great British story. It's 171 miles from source to sea, from the Staffordshire moorlands to the Humber estuary. As it meanders its way through the lowlands of the East Midlands, it's a border and a boundary, dividing north from south, county from county. For thousands of years, it's shaped the people and the places of this region. Discover the River Trent, and you discover a remarkable chapter in our great British story. I'm Tom Cunliffe. I've lived much of my life at sea. I've written books about nautical history and offshore navigation. But hey, this is Britain. The tentacles of the sea penetrate right to the heart of our nation. Today, I'm tackling the navigable River Trent and I'm finding living history all around me. I think he'd seen so many things disappear in his lifetime. He knew this was probably going to go. Although it's a lovely river, it's done a lot of damage. Since we don't have a museum to put the boat in, we're putting the museum in the boat. Newark's got something, a living history, if you like, something that's alive, and we want to keep it alive. For miles and miles, the Trent is truly wild. A barrier to boats, with the water too shallow to float them. But from the village of Shardlow in Derbyshire until it reaches the Humber and spills into the North Sea, vessels can set sail, and they've done so for centuries. My journey is just shy of 100 miles, along a watery highway that's formed and fashioned the villages and towns along its course. During my journey, I'll be catching a lift on a variety of vessels. I start on foot, walking through Shardlow. This was once an important inland port where canal and river run side by side, where the navigable Trent begins, and where I catch my first lift. Are you Barry Argent? Yes. <laughs> I'm Tom Cunliffe. How do you do? Uh, well, I'm very pleased to meet you because a word on the waterfront is that, that, that your dad actually operated a boat like this for real on, on the river and on the canal. Oh, yes, it? yes. Yeah, well, look, Barry, the navigable Trent is just round the corner here, isn't it? So, yes. um, any chance of flagging a ride down there? I'd yeah. love to see it with you. Yeah, if that... of course you can, of course you can. Barry Argent from Long Eaton's got boating in his blood. His mother was born on a boat, and his parents discovered romance on this river. They met and married while working the Trent. As a boat builder, Barry still has a strong connection to the waterway. I'm joining him on his boat perch, like the fish, for my first leg and for a trip down memory lane. Right, here we are, Tom. This is the Trent. This is where the navigable bit starts. You see, that there, that's the Derwent. That's the Trent. Oh, I that see. Com that comes from Derbyshire. Yeah. That comes from Staffordshire. Well, it's like summer holidays today, isn't it? But yeah, I bet yeah. it wasn't always like this. Just banging up and down here all the time, carrying cargo, it must have been a tough life. When my mum and dad worked together, it was hard work, very hard work. Uh, they used to work anything 18 hours a day was a typical day. Uh, they might tie up Sunday dinner as a bit of treat. They'd do 18 hours a day, six days a week. You know what I mean? Yeah. When they started their engine five o'clock in the morning, if it was stopped by 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock the next night, yeah. you know, that was it. It was moving. Why they was moving, they was making money. If they stood still, they weren't making anything. Well, we're just about to go under the M1 here, and it's like a sort of spectral, horrible thing, because here we are in this natural, nice way to transport. And up there, there's trucks thundering by. There's a whole oh, yeah. new world. 
What, what did it do to the community, all these nice people living together? Well, that was basically when it, it, it packed up and that, that was it. You know, all, all the general purpose cargoes, they stopped, they went onto the road and mostly went on to coal. You can't stop time, can you? No, no. It's not always a good thing. No. That's my dad. Barry's father was an amateur movie maker and his cine footage gives us an insight into what life was like on this working river. I'll tell you something, Barry, you know, your, your dad, to you, he's just the old man, but from where I'm looking, he's a pretty remarkable character because not only was he a skipper at the age of 16 and, and went on to skipper one of these dredges, a remarkable man of the water, but he's also a filmmaker. I mean, how come he got this kit and taught himself how to use it with his background? I don't, I don't really know. It's, it's just one that I think he'd seen so many things disappear in his lifetime. Yeah. And he knew this was probably going to go. Yeah. And so he thought, well, you know, I might as well get it on film. It's just something to remember, won't it? Well, I'm dead chuffed, Barry, that you brought me back here to this re remarkable cinema, the like of which I will be able to tell my grandchildren about. Uh -huh. You're never going to see anything like this again. Sadly, I've got to shove off because the lads are blowing the hooter down there at Trent Lock and I've got to hop another ride and get on downstream. That's fine. But fine. it's been an absolute privilege, mate. As we travel downstream, we reach Beeston, Nottinghamshire. It's here that the river became tricky to navigate. Big boats would run aground, and during hot, dry summers, the water became impassable. The Nottingham Beeston Cut was once part of a much bigger canal. Even today, it provides a vital link for boaters on the Trent. I'm catching my next lift with Bob Appleby. Bob knows this stretch well. Possibly better than anyone. He's lived on the cut for the last quarter of a century. So we're really getting into the city here, Bob. We guess. definitely are. We're, we're getting very close into the city now. Welcome to Nottingham. Let's do a fast rewind to 1818 while the locks are recycling. That was the year Mary Shelley published a horror story about Frankenstein. But the real horror story was going on right here. They used to ship barrels of gunpowder up to Derbyshire to blow the lead out of the mines up there. And one of the kegs started to leak onto the deck of the boat. Well, the boys thought they'd have a bit of fun and drop a hot coal onto it and just see what happened. <laughs> they found out real quick and they got a lot more than they bargained for. Instead of the small spark he'd expected, the whole blooming lot went up, killing eight men and two boys and demolishing dozens of properties between here and the marketplace. Accidents and deaths weren't uncommon on this waterway, but this was one of the worst. Travelling through Nottingham, you can still see the British Waterways building, formerly a warehouse, and a fine building it is too. I think I'm getting my head round this the whole business of the waterway now, Bob. It seems to me what we've got here is, a, is essentially a navigable river that's done a great job yeah. and has allowed commerce since the Bronze Age. Yeah. But uh, as boats got bigger and things and, and cities started to develop, you've got a situation whereby you've got to get the boats into the city and maybe the river's a bit problematic, so a canal like this does yeah. both jobs really, doesn't yeah, it? it does. As we head out of the city, we rejoin the river and it's here I'm visiting some super-sized derelict structures. Chris Matthews is a local historian who's an expert on this part of the Trent. Chris, on a scale of one to ten for sheer eeriness and spookiness, this place scores pretty high in my book. What, whatever was it for? Well, it's hard to find out exactly what it was for, but I was searching the archives and I found a booklet that was uh, printed by the Corporation of Nottingham, which today we call the City Council. Um, which was designed to show off what the city had to offer in terms of industry and transport. There are pictures of the council house, there are pictures of the uh, war memorial which had just been built and in the middle of this booklet is a picture of Trent Lane uh, Depot uh, because the city was saying look this is what we've got to offer in terms of transport and distribution. What you've got to remember was that around that time in the 1930s 
uh, Nottingham's lace trade was a little bit in decline um, and it knew that in order to continue successfully it had to diversify its economy things like pharmaceuticals and tobacco and all that sort of thing. So what were they actually bringing up river here? Um, well we're looking at the, uh, the, the finance records we know it's things like uh, grain, uh, food products, lots of timber, uh, lots of metal and we know there were some pretty big, big name clients that were involved. A company called Shell Oil, I'm sure we've all heard of those. <laughs> And in um, 1939, it says in the records that a company called uh, Messiah's Cadbury Limited of Bourneville were in touch about using the top three floors of warehouse number two, which is the one we can see there, yep. for the storage of cocoa, which is coming down the train from Hull on its way to Cadbury. Well, they were going to turn it into a lot of bars of dairy milk. That's right, yeah. Oh, it worked. If you fancy time travelling along with Trent, Chris organises Riverside Heritage Walks around Nottingham. His internet search words are Christopher Paul Matthews Nottingham. In 1936, nearly a quarter of a million tonnes of cargo were carried up the Trent and into Nottingham. Quite an achievement for a landlocked city, but ultimately poor maintenance of the river and the creation of the motorways led to the depot's demise. After the Nottinghamshire village of Gunthorpe, I reach the outskirts of Newark, where I'm meeting a man with a mission. I'm dropping downstream on a relic of the historic Trent. This old tug spent her working life pulling boats around and dragging them off when they went aground. But it's another boat I'm interested in, a bigger one. And I suspect that's the man behind this curious project. Had a good trip? Delightful. Good morning, Les. Welcome to Leicester Trader. By his own confession, Les Reed has given his life to boats. As a retired marine mechanic, he's sailed the seven seas, but he stays closer to home these days, and a project at the bottom of his garden is keeping him mighty busy. Well, it's a fantastic space when, you, when you're in here. You just you forget how big a little old ship's hold is, actually, and it's great. So listen, what exactly? Are you doing in here? I mean, I'm surrounded by wonderful things. There's a crowd of people here and busy with something, and uh, what, what's happening? Well, the idea is that since we don't have anybody on the Trent recording the history for posterity, and because it's been done everywhere else on every other big river navigation in the country, there's loads of museums, but not one thing about the Trent. Uh, my sort of 50 years of being seduced by this river, as you might say, and falling in love with it as a, as a young boy, being taken in and on the boats by a lot of the old boatmen who were such amazing blokes. And um, so here I am, left to do the job of um, recording the history for posterity. And um, since we don't have a museum to put the boat in, we're putting the museum in the boat. What's tremendous, Les, I think, is your ultimate vision to bring this boat down to the centre of Newark, a visitor centre, heritage centre, where everybody can come and visit the vessel, everybody can see what's going on, and, um, well, actually, can share in the vision that you've had. People love a boat. They do. Newark's got something, a living history, if you like, something that's alive, and we want to keep it alive. I've known Les since he used to work at the dockyard. Is uh, you know is is actually the driving force behind this project, and I know that he's got the he's going to make a good job of it. Les's enthusiasm is infectious. If you fancy helping out or want to discover more, the Newark Heritage Barge has a website. As for me, I'm moving on, and I'm getting a lift into Newark. Hundreds of families relied on this river for work. Wages were paid, men were hired and fired, and boats were built in the town. And there's one man who shaped this waterway more than any other. William Jessop was an English civil engineer. He was arguably as influential as Telford or Brunel, but he wasn't such a self-publicist. He'd successfully and very quietly completed the Grand Canal in Ireland and the Caledonian Canal in Scotland before he was assigned the Trent as chief engineer. Back in 1782, Jessup was the first chap to complete a detailed survey of the river. His goal? Get bigger and bigger boats up the Trent. 
A family firm of solicitors in Newark was in charge of all the legal documents and they still hold a copy of his historic survey. It's an amazing document and it shows how painstaking he was. He's identified 67 trouble spots on the river where shoaling was going to render it impassable for larger vessels. Now he didn't want to solve this problem with locks because of the expense, so he ordered a huge dredging programme which almost did the trick. But in some places it just wouldn't. Locks it had to be. Locks haven't changed much since Jessop's time and there are all sorts on our rivers and canals, but they all do the same job. They make rivers easier to navigate and allow man-made canals to march directly across land that's not level. Dale, we're here beside one of the biggest locks on the Trent and you have built for us here, and I've got to say, a phenomenal job. A model that's going to show me and everybody else, I hope, how the wretched things work. Right, the boat will be travelling down the river, come into the lock, yep. the lock gates will be closed. We'll now wind these paddles up, which will lower the water level down. They just open a flap in the bottom of the gate. Yes, they yeah. do. So the water's coming down out of the lock and draining into the, yes. into the river it's down below. Yeah. A lock has got three parts. It's got a watertight chamber, it's got gates at each end, and it's got a means of transferring water from one level to yes. another with the gate shut. Yes, very simple, basic, but it does the trick. It's fantastic. So the water levels inside and outside the lock are now the same, so that the, the, the lock gates should open very easily because there's no pressure keeping them shut, and it's a fingertip job now. Now the boat can travel on down the river, off on its merry way. If you want to see some impressive lock systems for yourself, Foxton near Market Harbour boasts ten in a veritable staircase and Fradley Junction near Burton-on-Trent has six. All along the Trent Valley the landscape is scarred by quarrying and the reason why? River gravel. This is a precious commodity which is dug, traded and transported across the UK and the Branfords claim to be the oldest barge operators, not just on this river, but in the whole of Britain. I'm joining the father and son team at Besthorpe, where they're loading up. The reason why there is so much gravel and grit sand around here is the Trent's huge floodplain. Back in the Ice Age, this meandering river was a whole lot bigger than it is now and torrents of meltwater came rushing down from the Pennines, from the Peak and from Charnwood Forest and they brought with them huge deposits and men make a good living shifting it from where it's ended up to where it's got to go. John, you've loaded coal for the steelworks, you've loaded fine sand for the glassworks and now we're deep down with sharp sand for the building trade. This has been going on for 50 years. You must know the Trent better than anybody alive. Yeah, well, I do, Tom, yeah. I mean, uh, I've done it for quite a long, lot of years now, so I've been in it all my life. I mean, I knew that I was coming onto the boats from being this high. And uh, I was captain of my own boat at 15, and I paid £450 for my first badge. My sweetheart then, as I was going out with, she fell out with me, because I was supposed to be getting married. I was 20. So I bought my first badge, I've come onto the Trent then, I've been working on it ever since. I'm now 67 and I'm so, you can work that out, I've been on here quite a while. I've seen a lot of changes. <laughs> this is old Bestor where we're coming to now. Uh, when I was 20 year old I came here for my first load with the Adamant. And when you got here there'd maybe 15, 20 badges waiting in them days. You know, all right, we carry more on, on one load, but in them days, there was a lot more by water than what there is now, Tom, a lot more. You've been working this river, well, you and your blooming grandparents for five generations, and your dad was telling me that you were a captain when you were 19 of 300 tonnes. I mean, that must be the youngest captain in the Western world these days. Well, I think I was uh, one of the youngest persons in the country to get uh, a captain's licence through grandfather rights, I believe. Right, grandfather rights, yeah, I remember that. That's 
Essentially, it means that you've been doing it, everybody else has been doing it, your parents have been doing it, you know how to do it. Who's going to teach you how to do this job? That's about it, really, isn't it? Well, that's, that's, yeah, that's basically it, yeah. Hopefully, I'll be able to teach my son to do it, but I, I would talk from, through my father. Well, it's a grand thing seeing all this sand. I bet you've got a deck chair out the back there or something. In the summer, you'll probably sit back here with your shades on and have a little beach party, do you? You found my secret now, yeah. I do actually do that, but don't tell me dad. <laughs> It might be overstating it, but in a way, you're boating royalty, you know. You come from a great long dynasty of boaters. It's been in your family as long as anybody can remember and beyond. Your son's working with you now on the barge. What about your grandchildren? How do you see the future? There's a lot more work could come onto the water, a lot more. And there's nobody lobbying for us in government type of thing. John, I've got a meeting in Gainsborough, and it's all very well, all this, but... Um, are we going to have enough water to float us up there? Definitely, Tom. You know, you're in safe hands here. We'll make it. <laughs> I'll put the engine on a bit now that we've got most of the talking to We'll get you there, I'm sure. Heading north on John's barge, we cruise past the start of England's oldest canal still in use. Originally built by the Romans, the Fosdyke joins Lincoln and the River Witham with the Trent. You can see its beginnings with huge locks keeping out the turbulent tidal waters. A stone's throw away stand the ruins of Torxey Castle. It never really was a castle, more a fortified manor house built so close to the water that these days it floods almost every winter. Time was when the Lord of the Manor had the right to levy a toll on every single vessel that came past his place, and that's probably why he built it there, a commercial decision. It seemed like a good idea at the time, and I expect for a while it was, but in the end it spelt the doom of the whole place. If you walk, cycle or boat the Trent, you can see notched marks on bridges, walls and even on the sides of houses. Engraved here are historic high water levels. The most prominent year is 1947. Back then, the country was still shocked by the aftermath of war. Nottinghamshire and Lincolnshire, like the rest of the country, were gripped by an iron winter with the biggest snowfall anyone could remember. Then, in early March, the great thaw began. The rain tumbled from the skies, but it couldn't penetrate the frozen ground, so it ran off the fields as if they were concrete and filled the river. The snow melt followed. The Trent reached its high water mark and kept right on coming at the terrifying rate of a foot per hour. The low-lying town of Gainsborough was entirely at its mercy, and I'm here to meet two people who remember that fateful day. Fred, you're 91, so yeah. you must have been, what, mid-twenties when all this happened? 26. 26. Have it, what are your memories of it? I remember getting up in the morning and looked out the bedroom window and the water was coming across from the River Trent down Tourist Street and it was running down there like a river. It kept coming down and then by tea time we got four foot six of water in the house. When it started coming up, we put the furniture upstairs, but we stayed upstairs, you know. We managed yeah. with quite enough food in it, as it happened, to carry on while I was able to get back in the house. But the house was never any more good. It was damp and all that. There were people who lost everything? Oh, yes, 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 who had lost everything. And what money they got compensated, it was pittance. How much of the town was really affected by this, Thelma? Well, most of it. In those days, uh, there was no houses or very few up the hill. Today, it's like another town in Gainsborough. We've got a lot of people living up the hill. In those days, there was loads and loads of, um, shall we say, little yards and squares. Um, and those uh, properties didn't come down until the 60s. So, and they were very old properties, and they all got flooded. The alleyways, yeah. all running down to the river. So it did affect, in the, I would say, about half the town. It does make you think, doesn't it, that towns like Gainsborough and Newark and some of the others have been entirely at the mercy of this river. Oh, that's right. Although it's a lovely river, it's done a lot of damage also. It has.
Since the inundation of 1947, this town has sorted out its flood defences and they've been tried and tested. From here, the Trent is wide and brown, coiled with currents and intimidating for the pleasure boater. Kidby Road and Rail Bridge is a Lincolnshire landmark. When it opened in 1916, a 200-foot central section was raised and lowered, allowing sailing barges to pass without lowering their masts. Problems with machinery in the 50s led to the arm being permanently fixed. All along the Trent, there are heritage groups enjoying this river's local history. But the people of the village of Burton-upon-Stather, the last on the banks of the Trent before we reach its mouth, are arguably the most enthusiastic and, dare I say, the most eccentric. This village is home to a World War II tank ramp and it was used mostly for testing amphibious craft. Many of them prototypes, all of them secret. Now they reckon they chose this part of the Trent because the banks are muddy and there's a swirling tidal effect and it was very similar to the rivers in the continent such as the Rhine where our tanks were going to have to fight their way ashore. And as you can see we've got a fine military escort here to take us through the rough stuff down to the real location. Craig, I've just spent a week on the river and it is just so good to get ashore and see all these guys dressed up in these wonderful vehicles. But it's all about this bit of concrete. Well, this, this is the tank ramp as it's affectionately known locally. And it was built in 1944 by the 79th Armoured Division, essentially for testing amphibious tanks and various ancillaries in preparation for crossing the River Rhine. So it really did mimic that river? Well, yeah, it did. Um, it's a big, as you can see, it's a big wide river with steep, muddy banks. They would basically go down here, down the ramp, turn around and come back, try and climb out of the Trent, fired a rocket and a chain across the other side to hook onto and haul themselves across. A lot of these things didn't always work, but some, some did. It's fantastic. And I think out of the corner of my eye here, I can see some photos. We have, yes. We've managed to find some contemporary photographs of the tank ramp uh, from the 40s. And um, what I really want to show you though, is we've actually managed to pull up some archive film footage. That's amazing, isn't it? To think that's happening right here where we're standing. Ab absolutely, here's one crawling up, this, up the ramp where we stood now. Yeah. Um, and this of course was all top secret film from contemporary from the time. Fantastic. And am I right in thinking that one of these tanks actually came back here? Part of our research, we actually found a guy who lives in Wolverhampton who'd restored a duplex drive Valentine tank. And not only that, he, he also told us that it was actually based here. So the next thing we did was get it here and we had what we called a tank day last year. Here it is actually coming down the ramp, uh, down the track onto the ramp, and there it is actually stood here as it would have done in 1944. What a wonderful noise it must have made. Well, I tell you, that is the icing on the cake for me. That is just really great. I'm so glad we came ashore here. Thank you very much. So, from tanks on the tidal trent to the men who still make money from working the river, this is an understated waterway. It doesn't have the glamour of the Thames or the dimensions of the Seven, but in its own right, it's seriously impressive and all along its course, you'll find living history to explore for yourself. Well, I've reached the end of my journey. This is where the Trent pours out into the Humber and joins the Yorkshire Ouse. Trent Falls, a dangerous place, and it's made doubly dangerous by the fog this morning. So that's it. I've seen the way the navigable Trent has shaped and formed this part of England. It's been quite a journey. <laughs>